Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, Episode 6, Marshal Brun. Although this episode will be focused on Marshal Brun, we will also talk of the heroism of two women in this story. Both played a role in the Marshal's life and eventual death. It is interesting to research each of these Marshals. My initial impression of Marshal Brun was that of an unspectacular, unscrupulous general who owed his Marshal's baton to one victory over the English and the support of Republican politicians in France. But there was more to this story, as we shall see. Guillaume Brun was born in Brive la Gaillarde, France, in May of 1763. He was the son of a lawyer, Etienne Brun, and his wife, Jean. For a while, it appeared the son would follow in his dad's footsteps. In 1785, at the age of 22, Brun moved to Paris to study law. He soon became in debt after spending most of his time drinking and gambling. To help pay off his debts, he got a job as a typesetter for a printing company and started publishing poetry from his own hand. He was described as artistic and temperamental. Using these qualities to support the French Revolution, he became a political journalist and started his own newspaper. Around this time, Brun married Angelique Pierre. She was the orphan daughter of a miller who was working as a metal burnisher when her beauty won the heart of the future marshal. They had no children of their own, but adopted two daughters. Soon after the outbreak of the French Revolution, Brun enlisted in the Parisian National Guard. Owing to his impressive height and patriotic demeanor, he was made captain. In 1792, as a favorite of famous revolutionaries like Danton, he was promoted to colonel. It was also during this year that an incident occurred that would eventually lead Brun to his demise, albeit 23 years later. As Royalist-backed foreign armies approached France to put an end to the revolution, the people in Paris started to panic, and mob rule took over. On September 2, 1792, the mob invaded a prison called La Force. 160 prisoners and three priests were massacred there by a hastily assembled People's Tribunal. The prisoners were thought of as traitors and accused of being part of the conspiracy to overthrow the government. Also held in this prison was Princess de Lambelle, friend and confidant of the Queen Marie Antoinette. Queen Marie Antoinette was the wife of the deposed king, Louis XVI. These last few moments of Princess de Lambelle's life demonstrate her incredible bravery. On September 3rd, she was taken out to a courtyard with other prisoners and brought before a hastily assembled tribunal. This kangaroo court demanded she, quote, take an oath to love liberty and equality and to swear hatred to the king and queen and to the monarchy, end quote. She agrees to the first part, but not to the latter part. The dialogue was recorded as follows. Who are you? Marie Therese Louise, Princess of Savoie. Your employment? Superintendent of the household to the queen. Had you any knowledge of the plots on the, co- the court on the 10th of August? I know not whether there were any plots on the 10th August, but I know that I had no knowledge of them. Swear to liberty and equality and hatred of the king and queen. Readily to the former, but I cannot to the latter. It is not in my heart. I have nothing more to say. It is indifferent to me if I die a little earlier or later. I have made the sacrifice of my life. Take Madame away. 
She was immediately taken into the street by a group of men who killed her within minutes. It was said that her severed head was stuck on a pike, which is basically a long spear, and shown in the prison window of her queen and friend, Marie Antoinette. Eventually, half the prison population of Paris was massacred, totaling almost 1,500 people. Because of actions like this, Brune began to sour on his revolutionary connections. To escape the chaos of Paris, Brune went to the frontiers to serve in the Army of the North. It was here, in Belgium and Holland, that Brune would have his greatest accomplishments. As we discussed in the previous episodes, the other monarchies of Europe were invading France from all directions to crush this revolution and restore the Bourbon monarchy. First, Brune served under General Dumouriez at the Battle of Nierwinden. At the Battle of Hanshut, Brune served under future Marshal Jourdan and helped defeat the British in 1793. He was also promoted to Brigadier General at this time. Returning to Paris, he was appointed to the Military Committee of the Convention. In 1795, food shortages and the unpopularity of the government resulted in mobs of insurgents forming in the streets. Brune aided in their violent dispersal by cannon under the command of General Bonaparte. With just 5,000 troops, Napoleon, Brune, and the future Marshal Murat crushed the 20,000 insurgents with the fame whiff of grape shot. Within a year, Brune was to join Napoleon's Army of Italy. He served in Massena's division and participated in the victories of Arcole and Rivole. His conduct won praise from Massena in the defense of San Michel when Brune's regiment beat a strong attack from the Austrian army and captured 500 prisoners and two cannons. Further praise came from Napoleon himself, quote, The grenadiers of the 75th took the guns with the bayonet. They had at their head General Brigade Brune, who had his clothes pierced by seven musket balls, end quote. Brune was then promoted to General of Division, the highest possible rank in the army at that time. In 1798, Brune was sent to head up the army that was completing the annexation of Switzerland. To help pay for Napoleon's expedition to Egypt, Brune extracted 14 million francs from Switzerland and left such a negative impression on the Swiss that his name became a byword for plundering. Unfortunately for his historical reputation, Brune had become infamous for his looting. He also had the audacity to charge 200,000 francs to conquered territories for the expense of previous looting. This is kind of like a burglar driving to your house, stealing most of your money, and then telling you to pay for the gas in his car. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. It was said that Brune's carriage was so overloaded with gold, it broke down shortly after leaving Switzerland. The Directory Government of France was pleased with his handling of Switzerland and dispatched him to take command of the Army of Italy. With little to do there, Brune amassed more personal fortune through plundering and swindling. 
Even his chief of staff, the future Marshal Suchet, was aghast at his shameless extorting. In 1799, the directory reassigned him to take command of 15,000 troops in Holland, where England was again threatening to invade France. An allied British and Russian force of 32,000 troops landed in Holland in August of 1799. The Anglo-Russian army, under the command of the Duke of York, had some initial gains, but quickly ran short of supplies. At Castricum, Brune positioned his men well in a defensive battle and then counterattacked. His energetic leadership and aggressive nature helped carry the battle. The French suffered 1,300 casualties, and the Allies suffered 2,500 casualties before retreating. By November, the Allies had reembarked and the invasion was over. Brune had saved France for a second time. Following this success, Napoleon dispatched him to the Vendée region to put down royalist rebels there. Achieving this, he was transferred to replace Massena as the commander in Italy once again. Massena's plundering in Italy had tested and finally pushed Napoleon's patience to the breaking point, and he was recalled. While in Italy, Brune was supported by a very able group of French commanders, including Generals Suchet, Monsi, Dupont, and de Vu. He won a close battle at Pozzolo, also known as the Battle of Mincio River, where he defeated a 50,000-man Austrian force. An armistice was signed shortly after the battle, and peace with Austria was declared in February of 1801. Brune was recalled to Paris, and Napoleon named him ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. This was an easy way to get him away from the capital of France. His Republican ideals didn't jive with Napoleon's growing centralized power. Napoleon also thought a general who had defeated the Russians and the British would have some sway in Constantinople. During his time abroad, Brune was named one of the original 18 marshals of the empire. His marshal's baton was controversial as there were definitely generals who deserved one more than Brune. Like Lefebvre, he received his baton to appease the Republican elements of France. When Napoleon declared himself Emperor of the French in 1804, the Ottoman Empire refused to recognize it. Brune was recalled for this failure, and the Turks were happy to see him go after two years of flamboyance and arrogance. From 1805 to 1807, Brune commanded an army in Balloon, where he basically deterred any more British invasions. He was then appointed governor of the Hanseatic cities in northern Germany. And in 1807, he was given a corps with which he seized Strasland. Next, Brune signed a treaty with Sweden for the island of Rügen but the wording of the treaty cost him his career. It mentioned, quote, the French army, end quote, instead of, quote, the army of his imperial and royal majesty, end quote. Napoleon was livid at this oversight, intentional or not, and Brune was dismissed from his command. Brune, in return, was angry that his good name should be suspected and refused any explanation and merely kept repeating to the emperor, quote, it is a lie, end quote. For the next seven years, Brune was unemployed and stayed at his country estate until 1815. During Napoleon's Hundred Days, he supported his former emperor's return. Forgiving their previous quarrels, Napoleon made him commander of the army of the Var. He was dispatched to the royalist area of Toulon to face an invading Austrian army. After Napoleon's subsequent defeat at Waterloo, he handed over command and set out to return to Paris. Alone and without an escort of troops, Brune stopped in Avignon to change horses. 
There, he was mistakenly identified by white terror royalists as the man who had paraded the decapitated head of Princess de Lambelle on a pike. The white terror was a reactionary violence that occurred when the Bourbon royals returned. The Bourbons were humiliated when they fled from Napoleon during his return in the Hundred Days' Reign of 1815. They looked like cowards when Louis XVIII and his cronies fled without firing a shot in defense of their throne. When the royals returned, they wanted to make sure they extinguished the Bonaparte flame forever. The royals also wanted to send a stern message for any potential usurpers. Napoleon's generals were cashiered, imprisoned, or shot. Officers were exiled, and the tricolor flag was replaced with a traditional white flag of the Bourbons, thus the name White Terror. Several hundred people were killed, and 70,000 were dismissed from their job positions. Brune was accused of being part of the Reign of Terror, and being present at the execution of Princess de Lambelle when he was attacked by this mob in Avignon. He quickly took shelter in his hotel room. His last actions were to try and write a letter to his wife Angelique. Whether he managed to complete it or not is unknown, but he was shot and stabbed multiple times before his body was drugged through the streets and flung into the Rhone River. It was said a local gardener or a local fisherman, whoever it was, a kind soul, found his corpse and buried it in a simple grave. For years, the wife of the marshal led many searches for his body. She also wanted to get the true story, as the royalist authorities first reported that his death was a suicide. Finally, a few years after the marshal's death, with the assistance of the man who buried his body, his remains were sent to his wife for a proper burial. Thanks to his wife's tireless efforts, an inquiry was made public that Brune's murder had been covered up by royal authorities. With tremendous courage, his wife obtained from the king the right to pursue his assassins. On February 25th, 1821, a court recognized that the marshal had not participated in the murder of Princess de Lamballe. War ministry archives show he wasn't in Paris at that time. This effort to clear his name was incredibly brave on his wife's behalf during a time when Bonapartists and their families were disgraced, imprisoned, or killed. It was not until 1839 that a fitting monument was raised in his hometown to the memory of the marshal. As an independent commander, he had a battle record of four wins and two losses. Although he was a grifter and a looter, he was also a patriotic warrior and a good husband, and had twice been called the savior of his country. I feel like we can end on this point from Marshal Brun. For our next episode, we will learn about Marshal St. Cyr, nicknamed the Owl, by the army for his cool but honest disposition. Thanks for joining us.